Hello, everybody. I'm Ashby Monk. Um, I am uh, executive director of the Stanford Long Term Investing Initiative. I'm also an advisory board member um, to the PI World Pension Summit. And it is in my capacity as the advisory board member that I get the opportunity to nominate speakers to do a board talk. And in this case, I have nominated a dear friend of mine, Eric Reese. Eric, welcome. I'm going to tell the world about you briefly. Um, uh, Eric is a, is a multiple time entrepreneur. He's built many companies, also is a New York Times bestselling author. He wrote the book, The Lean Startup. It's sold over a million copies. It's probably been published in many languages. Um, and he is the creator of the Lean Startup methodology. And he is also the founder and uh, chief executive officer of Long-Term Stock Exchange. And we're just thrilled to have you here, Eric, to talk about the future of finance, the future of long-term investing. We both ha are at organizations that have long-term in the title. Um, we'll just jump right into it, if you don't mind, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. Um, so we, we ask fun questions in these board talks. I think the first one we want to understand is just to get a little bit of history of you personally. You know, we all have different stories about how we ended up in this world of financial services and long-term investing. It would be interesting to hear your personal story of how you got here. Yeah, and thanks thanks again for having me and always, always good to see you. Uh, I'll be at virtually this time. So... Gosh, how did this, how, where to start? So I'm a computer software guy. You know, I'm, if you have a, a stereotype in your mind of the kid who grew up in their parents' basement programming computers, that's totally me. I, I, I did that. My parents were concerned that I didn't get out, get enough sunshine and didn't have enough uh, time playing outside. Okay, that, that, that was me. <laughs> and when I found out as a kid that you could get paid to do computer programming, I felt like I had won the cosmic lottery. Like to me, that was like getting paid to do video games all day. I just like, I couldn't think of anything more fun that I wanted to do. And then the idea that that could be a job or a career, I mean, wow, that was exciting. So I definitely never imagined that I would wind up in anything remotely resembling financial services. The evolution went as follows. I, I got bitten by the technology bug. I built you know, tons of, of programs and I was li make work my, my living as a programmer. I got a computer science degree. I was in college during the dot-com bubble. So I got bitten by the entrepreneurship bug. But unlike people who wanted fame and fortune out of entrepreneurship, to me, it just seemed like an even better way to build more awesome technology and have a job where I could have even more impact. And the only tiniest little itsy bitsy glitch in my grand plan is that the way that we sell entrepreneurship and especially to young people where you just basically create something awesome and then, you know, you get to be on the cover of magazines. It lies over the fact that most startups fail. And even the ones that do succeed, there's a lot of really boring stuff that you have to get right in order for the company to succeed. So I kind of I kind of had my, my dreams dashed over and over again. Entrepreneurship is like a repeated kicking in the head of the fact that if you don't, you know, if you just build great technology and that's all you do, it's not sufficient to get the outcomes that you want, you know, as you well know. So making a very long story short. I wound up building companies in a really different way, a way that was more scientific, more iterative, um, I think more humane than was the kind of conventional way that at first technology companies had been historically built. And that was successful for me. And I, I had some success in my career building products that people actually liked. And then I wound up um, basically writing and talking about this approach, which I didn't even know what to call it at the time. You know, it was just, uh, to me, it was just the intuitive way to avoid making these painful mistakes. But uh, borrowing some concepts from lean manufacturing, I eventually settled on calling it lean startup. And I didn't think of that as a new career. That was just to me like a, you know, something I was doing on the side, almost as a hobby, writing, a, you know, first a blog, uh, and then, you know, doing conferences and speaking and stuff about this idea of lean startup. But this is around the time of the financial crisis. There was intense interest in new models, especially new models of entrepreneurship. And lean had come back into fashion after, you know, a, a decade, a very high burn decade. And all of a sudden, um, my life changed. And people started asking me to speak and work with their companies and you know, go all over the world and talk about lean startups. So anyway, uh, I wound up writing a book. Uh, as you mentioned, the lean startup became a huge global phenomenon in 2011. Now, this might seem a very far cry from financial services. And it really is. I mean, that, that's exactly right. But here's... <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, I, I think in hearing the story that you're driving, I mean, I think some people forget how innovation and failure and, you know, the, the, the boring parts of entrepreneurship, I think are, it's, it's fascinating to hear you talk about it because I think too often, like you say, it's like the, the front of the cover of the magazine is kind of the, the prototype of the entrepreneur. Yeah. But I think the way you're describing it is much more real. Yeah, yeah. If you if you ever want to get a really great look at what the conventional telling of an entrepreneurial story is, I recommend the movie Ghostbusters. The <laughs> movie about the paranormal is actually an amazing entrepreneurship story, like very classic. They're down to their last dollar in the petty cash drawer before the market turns, and they're able to make their dreams come true. And anyway, it's always told that way, where the really bo- the most important decisions that entrepreneurs make, the really boring stuff, the gritty stuff, the management stuff, the accounting stuff, that's always swept under the rug in the little photo montage in the middle of the movie. You know, no, nobody wants to hear about that. But that's actually what makes innovation possible. And the greatest entrepreneurs are masters of the details, much more than they are just kind of like the way that they're per- per- portrayed in, in media. So anyway... As I was touring the world, basically getting, I feel like I got issued like a backstage pass to the world of how business actually operates. Because if you name any combination of company size, industry, sector, um, you know, age, I have done lean startup transformation at any combination you could like, you know, from two, two founders in a garage up to the world's largest multinationals, you know, defense departments and governments and NGOs. And everything in between, small business, medium business, big business, mega business, you, you name it, I've, I've been there. And you can't do that work without becoming radicalized on one very specific point, which is no matter where you go, and no matter how good the management system is of the organization you build, you are always up against these fundamental forces of incentive design that emanate from the capital markets. And I didn't know that. I just kept running into the situation where companies would, you know, eviscerate themselves and immolate, self-immolate their innovation program. And I would ask them, why are you doing this? And even the managers who were overseeing the dismantling themselves would say, I know this makes no sense. I know this is value destroying, but it's what Wall Street wants. And that never made sense to me. I just feel like, wait a minute, you're telling me that your investors want you to lose their money on purpose? Like, no way. You know, I was like, sure, how could that possibly be right? But I didn't, you know, what do I know? I didn't, I never worked on Wall Street. I didn't know a lot of bankers. I didn't, you know, I, well, I'm not a public market investor. I didn't know, I didn't even know what the buy side was compared to the sell side. I didn't know anything. So as I kept encountering this over and over again, I started to get more educated and I started to meet actual investors. And of course, investors would say, we're not the short-term ones. You know, we're not the ones doing that. Uh, management's out for themselves. And let me tell you about how executive compensation's out of control, and et cetera, et cetera. And it just seemed really obvious to me that, I wouldn't have been able to put it in these terms at that time, but we have built a financial system that is dominated by transaction volume. The vast majority of intermediaries make their money by transaction volume. And what generates more transaction volume is chaos, destruction, you know, volatility, you know, insanity. So these kind of crazy M&A adventures that companies go on and these ridiculous perpetual reorgs and having 10 CEOs in five years, all, all the chaos it's very good for volatility and, um, and transaction volume, but mm-hmm. it's not actually good for fundamental value creation. It's not good for the employees of the company. It's not good for their customers. It's not good for any of their other stakeholders. And anyway, what I realized was that we had a basically a disconnect where um, the interactions between companies and their actual investors, the true owners of those equities, have become so intermediated that we've allowed middlemen to write all the rules and to design the system. It's like a classic mm-hmm. tail wagging the dog kind of, uh, kind of system. And I didn't know the solution, but it just seemed to me, and I wrote this in my book 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago now. I just said, look, from first principles, even though I didn't know anything else, from first principles, it seems to me like those companies that actually have a long-term operating philosophy and those investors who have multi-generational timescales ought to partner together to make more money. We don't need regulatory reform. We don't need government. Like, all we need is a mechanism by which those two stakeholders can come together and partner together to make more money. And I was like, am I crazy? Is that not a stock exchange? An institution that can regulate the behavior of investors and managers at the same time. So I wrote in my book, somebody should really create a long term <laughs> stock exchange or LTSE. And that would work this way. And I sketched out how it should happen. And as far as I was concerned, that was my last, my first and last foray into financial services and I can get back to my life. But that's not quite how it turned out. 
<laughs> it's funny because I think in hearing you describe that, I'm reminded that when we met, I, I felt like my world were those long-term investors and your world were the founders and entrepreneurs and C-suite executives at the companies. And we both had this realization, actually, both of these sets of communities are quite long-term, but it's the intermediaries that tend to drag that time horizon towards, you know, quarter to quarter earnings and, you know, monthly, um, you know, data, whatever it is, right? I, I think it is, it's very true to say that on both ends of that capitalist system, you have actors that want to be long-term. And so then let's talk about the long-term stock exchange as this thing that you've built. Maybe give us a little of the history of LTSC and then give us also a current state of where you are and what's going on. Yeah, boy, this has been, uh, you, as you mentioned at the top, when you put long-term in the name of the company, you know you're going to be in for quite a ride. So it is, this has been a, <laughs> grueling, a grueling project to work on. But um, as I said, I wrote about it in 2011. So um we first raised money for the company in 2016 and people sometimes were like, well, what were you doing for five years? But no joke. That's how long it took me to figure out that this was even possible to do because we have come to treat the rules of the road and the infrastructure that supports our capital markets as if it was like handed down by God on stone tablets. You know, we're very reluctant to change it or we, or we especially when outsiders show up asking why are things the way they are, we're always told that, you know, it's the efficient market hypothesis or something like there's some reason with just like a just so story for why it has to be that exact way. And as a result, the system actually changes quite often, but it always changes in very specific directions. So when I showed up telling people, hey, I want to change back in the direction of corporate governance, of long term value creation, of multi stakeholder thinking, people looked at me like I had three heads. It took me a really long time to figure out not only that this was achievable, but actually it could be a, a viable for-profit business. It didn't have to be just, you know, a, a somebody's science project. And in all those years, I kept expecting I would find someone who wanted to build this thing instead of me. Because I didn't feel like, I'm like, I was not the right person to do this. I don't have a background in financial services. And, and frankly, I liked what I was doing before quite a bit. So I wasn't like looking to do a new thing, but this idea would not leave me alone. And the more I talked to people about it and asked them why it would never work, and the more people told me that it would never work, but for terrible reasons, the more convinced I was. I was like, something, I'm onto something here. There's something here that's worth investigating. So um, it took five years to figure out like just a legal, technical, regulatory apparatus, how, how to assemble the right kind of team to do this. This is a very difficult project. It, you know, we used to joke, it's just your average old five-sided marketplace where you have to build a value shop that works buy side, sell side, VCs, founders, and regulators all at the same time. Like, what could possibly go wrong? So yeah. uh, we raised money in 2016 from a bunch of the top tier venture firms, you know, as you'd imagine in, the, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Took us three full years to get the regulatory approval to operate the exchange. And I won't bore you with the ups and downs and all the stuff we saw in DC. Like it was a very eye-opening experience to go through that. Um, got what's called the Form 1 approval in 2019. Uh, we raised our Series B then. And then it took us all that time from then until now to get the exchange open and get the first listings. So we are now a national securities exchange. We're in the same regulatory category as NYSE and NASDAQ. Um, and although nominally there are 15 other U.S. stock exchanges, the truth is the majority of the trading volume and all of the listings in public equities are really dominated by just the two players that have had this duopoly for so many years. So this is actually the very first new public listings venue with its own distinct governance model that's been created since the creation of NASDAQ in the early 70s. And for the first time in 50 years, we have a listings venue that has more than one listing on it. So we have two. Wow. <laughs> And so the people watching this are long-term investors for the most part, pension funds, um, obviously, but also endowments, foundations, sovereign funds from around the world. And, and like, if you can, in a simple manner, those organizations that are listed on LTSC, those companies that have chosen to go through that step, what is that? What should have me, if I'm a long-term investor, what should I see that as a signal of? Like, can you put a little bit of like meat on the bone of what those companies are you know, expressing by listing on the LTSC? Yeah, so we have a set of principles that we stand for. And they're things, they're all things that we've been talking about in this community needing to do since forever. Long-term compensation for executives, long-term compensation for the board, 
board oversight of long-term strategy, sustainability, diversity and inclusion, um, treating the long-term investors as distinct from the short-term investors, and of course, having a multi-stakeholder philosophy of business. So every company that lists on the LTSE is required to make commitments to those principles. Now, as soon as you hear that, you're like, oh, another press release, great. That's what we need. Companies put out another press release about how great they are. I mean, that was the last time you read an, uh, an S1, you know, from a company going public, they didn't have all these keywords in it. But if you look carefully and say, okay, I see the promises they're making in the founder's letter. Let me read the rest of the S1. Let me look at the charter. Let me look at their corporate structure. Let me look at how the company is governed. Are those promises reflected in the governance? Of course not. And if they're not reflected in the governance, why on earth should I believe them? Hold on. We want companies to be able to win the public's trust by making promises that people can believe. That's really what this is about. So when a company lists on LTSC, they are making a binding commitment to a set of policies that implement the principles that I've just described. Now, it's not a one-size-fits-all checklist-based approach. We call it principles-based listing standards. But the commitments right. are just as binding. They have actual bona fide penalties. And mm -hmm. they are declarations of how the company is going to be governed in the future. And especially for this new generation of founders and employees who are very values oriented, very purpose driven. If you look at their marketing, you look at their employment brand, you look at the employee activism that is rising in these companies. Um, they're very serious about values. It's, it's a competitive advantage to first of all, be able to make such commitments and have all stakeholders believe them. And then for this conversation, especially, it is a major source of competitive advantage to have long-term values aligned investors on the cap table who can support the uh, support and protect the development of that purpose over time. I, I would imagine that if you're a long-term investor and you see a company that is signaling their long-term, your expectation would be they're investing more in research and development. They're, you know, managing stakeholder relations in a way that is more sustainable, ditto for the environment. And so they're kind of managing the, the long-term kind of tail risks and so I would expect the performance of these stocks would actually be higher. Have you, I, I'm, I'm sure you haven't seen that yet, but I, is that part of your kind of assumption set? That Listen, we, when we did research, the two things that really caught my eye when we were developing this, one is the research that shows that companies that have that philosophy and are governed in that way, way, way dramatically outperform the market is like, we, we did some research of our own, but that research is well established in the literature. And yeah. I think even still is underappreciated because we've had such a race towards diversification and passive investing is kind of like one of the mega trends of the last few years. Like, I think we've kind of lost sight of the fact that companies that are actually creating value are really just a fundamentally different asset class than companies that are coasting and extracting value from the good choices they've made in the past. And I'm not here to say that, you know, no one should make money from, ex from exploitation or extraction, just to say that that's a different, that's a different thing. And if you look over long enough time horizons, that's where the returns are. Plus, for those of us who are planning for our society to exist decades from now, let alone thrive, um, those are the investments that need to be made in order for our civilization to be preserved. So I feel like there's a double benefit to making those investments. You know, you obviously get the superior returns, but you also feel like you're part of creating the reality of the future that your institution is meant to inhabit. Um, so that's an advantage that long-term investors have you know, over short-term investors. And the second thing, and this is, this is a little more surprising to me, is that if you take the exact same company and do nothing else but swap out some of the short-term investors with long-term investors, you instantaneously make the company more valuable. You drive volatility down like 30%. You drive short interest down instantaneously. And that doesn't seem like a big deal, but then... That has major implications for the performance of employees. And um, obviously, because companies use stock as a compensation instrument, it has way, way different effects on the company's willingness to invest in R&D, for example. Um, you, see that, you see that in the data really clearly. And there's been some pretty clever studies to, to tease apart those, uh, those effects. So it's not just finding the good companies and weeding out the bad companies. I wish it was that simple. Like That's a kind of a childish black and white kind of view of this. It's also about pushing companies in the good direction in a way from the bad direction. So like we are like the corporate conscience, if you will, uh, yeah. of, of these super organisms 
that are trying their best to do the right thing, but are under constant pressure from bad actors to do the wrong thing. Shifting the gears a little bit towards the investment industry, which is kind of one side of, of, of obviously the exchange. You need to bring the long-term investors in. You've talked about how valuable it is to have long-term investors on the cap table of these companies for the various incentives they create. Um, what do you consider as the biggest challenge, um, either working with the community of long-term in investors or for the industry itself in the coming years? And in a sense that what should we be working on as an industry of long-term investors um, in order to improve and get better and frankly back long-term companies? This is going to sound stupid, but you have to actually do it. And if you look at like, where is the actual money going after, after it passes through all these hands of fees on fees on fees on fees, where's it being invested? A lot of times at the base of that stack is just a bunch of secondary stock transactions. It hasn't actually financed any net new activity at all in the world, which like I get it. If you're an individual person saving for retirement and you want to just be a passive investor and be fleeced by fees, like, okay, I understand. But for these largest asset owners in the world to, um, you know, to not, I think they have a sacred obligation to actually finance net new innovation at least as much as they're financing, you know, the old release to finance infrastructure projects, you know, where that, that's where the returns were. So like, you know, if you could see it, at least with a bridge or a dam or something, you could see what you're investing. I get that investing in innovation is more difficult, um, but I don't see the alternative. I don't understand why that's not a bigger priority for, for folks in this community. To give them some credit, Eric, um, they, they're, they have one foot often in some government bureaucracy and they have another foot in, you know, the icy veined world of financial markets. I mean, it is challenging to build an internal capability um, to transact with the types of companies. And I think oftentimes, and the challenge that we find is a lot of those long-term companies tended to be private. And I think the, the revelation of your exchange the long-term stock exchange is it is actually a public market venue where you can express long-termism and doing like you should build an index of long-term companies that wouldn't be hard you know for these organizations to allocate capital into um doing a late stage growth venture deal is hard it's for, hard for organ yeah yeah, yeah. no oh, unfortunately the ability for especially public institutions to deploy capital effectively across the private ecosystem. Like there are a lot of factors that work against that, including many institutions that are completely locked out of those opportunities to get into those deals. So uh, I don't think that's right by, you know, for the record, I don't think that's a good thing. I think that's a, a huge public policy error that has to be corrected. And of course, part of our mission in LTSE is to bring growth back into the public markets by having companies be able to go public and maintain that long-term perspective that they're able to get in the private markets now. And if people are sanguine about this, I just, I just saw this yesterday. People, the main thought leaders in the venture ecosystem, in the private company ecosystem, the people that CEOs look up to the most are constantly putting out a message now that you should not take your company public. Either don't do it at all. That was one of the big thought leaders was yesterday. They had a whole thing about do not just don't take your public at, at all or delay it as long as possible. So at the point that we've made being public so relatively unattractive that that's the advice that entrepreneurs are given, that's bad. Like that's bad for pensions. That's bad for, for sure. not in the top tier uh, venture funds. And even for those who are, you know, people are paying a huge premium to access companies that in any other era would have already been public and you could have had low cost access to. So yes, I think to the extent that people are willing to put their money where their mouth is to say that they want this to change. That's the first step. You know, I can say that I, I've done the analysis. Like I've seen everyone's investment philosophy and all the principles that they signed up for. And it's like, okay, if we could take action, like this is a community that has tremendous power. If it was willing yeah. to exercise that power on behalf of this problem could make a real dent in it. To absolutely. And it, it is shocking to hear that, um, you know, that, that they're still saying companies should stay private. And that's probably why I got involved with you and your project at LTSE is you, you know, you can get that, that exposure in public markets for a basis point, but you, you, or less, um, you, 
to get it in the private markets, you either have to build a very sophisticated internal team, which, you know, less than 20 in the world have done in the pension space, yeah. um, or you got to pay two and 20. And so even if the companies can grow faster in private markets, which we can debate, we've seen a lot of companies that seem to be growing fast, but maybe that's a function of marking to market um, or accounting based valuations. But that any benefits that seem to accrue there get gobbled up by the fund managers rather than flowing through to the asset owner community. Anyway, I think we're both singing from the same song sheet here. Yeah. Eric. We both, yeah. Yeah. You really, you know, if, if, if people are willing to give them an effective monopoly, you know, those rents are going to be extracted higher and higher as, you know, as the returns increase. And I mean, more and more venture firms in Silicon Valley are becoming registered investment advisors and are moving to permanent capital right. of their own. And like, if you just ask why, you know, you know why. So I just think that's a that is a limited opportunity, and it's just it's a mistake to. And, I'm, and many of my best friends are venture capitalists. I'm not saying that they're bad. Like I think the best VCs add a tremendous amount of value in the world, partly because they actually have the sophistication you're talking about and the conviction to write these checks that uh, many of the rest of us don't. But to say that that should be the only venue by which innovation gets financed, especially the later stage stuff where the risk is starting to come down. I think taking that growth out of the public markets, I just don't think that's, um, I don't think that's been a good change. I agree. Let's shift gears and, and kind of reveal a little bit about you. Um, you know, you've built multiple big companies, you've taken on this new mental challenge. And I think it's always interesting for people to hear a little bit about like what's happened in, in your life. And one of the questions that we often ask is around like the best and worst advice you've ever got either in your life, if you really want to go to that level, or in the process of building out LTSC. What is the best and worst advice you received? I think the best advice I ever received was to realize, and this is really hard to do, easy to say, very hard to do, but realize that when someone is giving you feedback, they're giving you information about themselves and not about you. So like, I, I've probably had a thousand 5,000, I don't know, I have no idea how many thousands of conversations I've had with people who are far more knowledgeable than me about LTSC, about capital markets, about going public, about, you know, like talking, I've, I've pitched the company millions of times. I have been counseled founders. I, I've spent a lot of time in this world just talking about this idea. And I would say this is a very polarizing idea. So for every person who thinks it's just the most brilliant, awesome thing they ever heard, there's also, you know, several times as many people who think it's pretty much the stupidest thing they've ever heard. Well, I used to think, okay, I gotta be, I gotta be tougher and build that hard exterior, become cynical and crusty and, you know, and this advice really transformed it for me. It was like, no, actually every person is just revealing to you what they care about, what they like, what they want. And they might be right. They might be like, when they're telling you about you, they don't know who you are. They don't, you know, they don't. They don't know, they don't know or generally care about your inner reality. They're just saying that like, I want this, this is what I'm looking for. And that ability to parse feedback in that different way was absolutely essential to building this company. I would have gone crazy without it. So I think that was the, that was the best advice that I got. That's great. Worst, worst, worst advice? Probably the worst advice. I don't know. The jury's still out on this one, okay? Because it all depends on whether this was actually a good idea to spend this some of my life on this project or not. But the worst advice I got, when I first started talking to people about this, almost every advisor I took it to was just like, this is not the right project. They always like, this is an old man's game. Do this in retirement. You know, when you're hmm. done with your career and you want to go, you know, lecture or pontificate about long-termism or whatever, go ahead. But like, don't waste the prime of your career life on this crazy, on this crazy errand. And, and I mean, listen, if this all turns out to, if this ends in disaster, maybe I'll look back and be like, actually, it would have been a good retirement project, not this. But I just feel like is, in our world, there is this tremendous cynicism about whether reform is possible. Mm. And just, you know, the majority of voices for reform are like people, they are retired. The people at the end of their career are the people, you know, who are not really in a position to like push for the reform directly themselves as their job. They're kind of like, listen, I, listen, kid, I'm just here to tell you how it is, you know, based on my experience as a CEO or as an investor or, or whatever. And I don't mean to denigrate yeah. people at all. I think that, that wisdom is extremely valuable. I have learned a lot from those people. I call many of them my mentors. But I do think that there's kind of a lack of willingness 
for people to actually really engage with their actual career in the project of reform, especially at a time in the world when it's so urgently needed. Like our civilization is actually falling apart at the seams. I'm sure people have noticed. So like, I, I mean, it's like, this is actually critically, a critical time for us to make this transformation, this leap in consciousness from a more extractive to a more generative mindset. And so I think many people, and I'm sure even many people listening to this, like you could be an advocate for these changes right now in your current job. And like, maybe there's some risk in that. Maybe, you know, like, I, like I'm not here to say that it will be an really easier life path by any means. But I think when we, when we all get together at the, after we're all retired and we're all having a drink and talking about what we accomplished in our lives, I think, we'll, I think those of us who make that leap will be proud to say, like, we, we at least made an attempt to, to steer the civilization onto its right course. We elite privileged few who, were, who have had access to the levers of power to the decision-making authority. We, we used our voice and our privilege and our power to um, try to make change. And so I, I hope more people will take up that challenge. Thank you, Eric. And um, we're not done, but I just still wanted to say thank you for oh. like dedicating you. <laughs> for dedicating your life to this work. I think it's ultimately why I invited you on here. I think it is, it is inspirational. And, and to give you some credit, I mean, when we first started working together four, three, four years ago, like it was a pretty crazy idea. But I'll tell you today, like you, people, when I would tell them, they'd be like, they'll never get a listing. Maybe they'll get their, their form one. Maybe a lot of people were dubious. Um, but they'll never get a listing and you have two and I, and there's another one I've seen in an S one file. So there's others, there's others coming. Yeah. And so I think you've already demonstrated, um, you know, it, it's like a, some novel concept of a bureaucratic entrepreneur or the ability to think very creatively in environments where creativity is scarce. <laughs> um, like you've done, you've, you've been a role model for me and in, in trying to work, for example, with public pension plans to build innovation units or R and D units. So yeah. um, I'm glad you ignored the bad advice not to, not to do it. And we're very yeah. grateful, Eric, for you coming. Um, you know, you the work you've done over the years is astounding and it's amazing because it goes from all the way, the world of startups with the lean startup and building innovation mechanisms all the way to bureaucracy and administration and kind of trying to reconcile these the rules of the game full so, stack maybe that's why they call it full stack that's the key full yeah. stack. exactly yeah. vertically integrated um so yeah. thank you for joining us oh, in you. my pleasure my pleasure to come by and uh, always always good to see you thank you and and last to the viewers out there thank you for watching this um i hope you enjoyed hearing from eric reese um who's a who's a legend here in silicon valley for doing all kinds of remarkable things um, but we look forward to seeing you, viewer, um, between the 2nd and 4th of November at The Hague for the World Pension Summit. And with that, we'll send it back back to the studio. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Albert. <laughs>